Today, welcome to Neon Radio. We've got Amanda Bucci Yay, joining so us today. Excited to have you. Podcast you, collab. Podcast you collab. Yours You're, recently. Yeah. Super excited. Which just came out today, actually. I saw. Yeah. I, have, I still have to like, go through it all, but yeah. I'm excited to check <laughs> it out. You're crushing it in the podcast entrepreneur fitness, which you're moving into on more entrepreneurship stuff. Yeah, totally. Um, but let's just get a little backstory on how you got started into all this online business and creativity and you know what you were, you're moving from fitness to more of an entrepreneurship spin. Yeah, absolutely. So I love that your podcast is focused on creativity because as a kid, I thought that I didn't have a creative bone in my body. It was funny, like maybe not as a kid because as a kid, I, I remember like drawing and doing stuff like that, but I was always very good at science and I was good at school and I was good at the tactical logical and I forget which side of the brain is it right or left. That's the right logic. brain. Right believe, brain. Yeah. I was very right brain and I still am. But I, in high school, kind of just put myself in that little box and I was like, this is me. I'm not creative. I am tactical logical. Yeah. And now I'm starting to realize how untrue that is, but we'll totally get there. Um, yeah. But I love that your podcast is about creativity and I love talking about it. So when I first got started in doing what I'm doing now, whatever that is, um, I basically just started my Instagram and I was sharing my life. So I was in high school and I wasn't the best at sports. I was kind of mediocre. I remember in high school, freshman year, I wanted to join the soccer team, but I had exercise induced asthma. So we had to do a two mile run and I was the last person and I skipped a lap. It was awful. Terrible memories <laughs> of like the, the hot sun in the middle of August, not doing good at the whole cardio thing. And it was just terrible. So my mom got me a personal trainer. I loved fitness. I fell in love with it. I trained like five, six days a week in high school. And then once I got to college, I had my own car so I could go to the off-campus gym because I was really, really into fitness. And there was a lot of people that liked exercising in college that I was friends with, but not people that were as into it as I was. I was yeah. super passionate about it. So I remember specifically I started my Instagrams because I wanted to share that side of my life without being ridiculed by my peers. I mean, in college, most people aren't really staying in on Friday nights so they can go to the gym in the morning and then do their part-time job in the afternoon. Exactly. It wasn't really a thing for most people anyway. So for me, I was craving community. I was craving others who were like-minded. I didn't know anybody too, too like-minded in my local network, essentially. Mm -hmm. I was in nursing school, so a lot of the people were mm -hmm. at least staying in on Saturday nights so they could study on Sunday, but that was about it. And I found a really great community on Instagram. I loved like finding and following people that were posting about fitness and their journey. That's what I did. So I started growing my following organically just through sharing my story and sharing insight and knowledge. I started on YouTube because I was like, you know, this is a great platform to talk more about it. Yeah. And I could give more information. And here's my like logical, nursey, you know, educational side coming out, teachery type of thing. And it was just a, a way for me to create longer form content and teach people about what I was doing. And people loved it. Like people caught on. Um, I had no idea, zero clue what entrepreneurship was, number one. <laughs> and the fact that being a YouTuber was a thing, number two. There was people that, you know, created YouTube videos for a living. Yeah. I didn't know that that wasn't even a thing. I didn't even watch YouTube videos in Rhode Island when I was there. Wow. I just started my channel because I was like, oh, that sounds great. Like better way to talk about more things. So yeah. I remember meeting this guy named Dom Mazzetti. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. No. Um, he's been on Facebook and YouTube making videos for like 10 years now. And he's a personality. His actual name is Mike. So Dom is his character. And okay. he's this like, Jersey douchey fitness type of guy and I remember seeing his videos and people would repost them in, on Facebook in high school in college and I met him in person in LA he lives in LA and I become friends with his girlfriend and I was like oh people do this for a living I had no clue so I, it kind of sparked my interest in taking it more seriously I really so I remember in January of 2016 I was like I will get a hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube with this year, it's my main goal, and I went from 6,000 to 100,000 in six months. Wow. Just making five, six videos a week. I was sharing about my fitness journey. I was doing competitions, so I was showing my food and my training, and I was getting really shredded, and it was really interesting, oh really God. fun. So it was just something that I thrived on. So by the time I graduated nursing school, I lost my passion and excitement for nursing, and I didn't really have it to begin with. Like. It was one of those things when you're a high school student and you're 17, you're like, what are you gonna do for the rest of your life? And me, yeah. logical brain said, I'm good at science and I like helping people. Mm -hmm. And those were the two things that I was like, okay, nursing makes sense, it's safe, it's yep. respectable by my parents. And 
I just kind of went for that. But by the end of my four years and I was growing on social and it was really fun and enjoyable and I was super passionate. I was like, I'm so passionate about this thing. There was this like gut feeling. I don't know if you've ever felt a gut feeling that you just had to be doing something. You were so pulled towards it mm -hmm. that I knew regardless of whether or not I knew what the steps were, because I had no clue what my next steps were. Right. I just knew that I had to, to go on that path. Yeah. So I ended up just saying no to nursing. I didn't continue on with it. And I continued on with this entrepreneurship YouTuber. Like I didn't even know what it was. Yeah. I didn't know what to call it. So moving forward, fast forward to now, I have you know built my platform on fitness, but I've transferred into entrepreneurship more just because fitness took a little bit of a back seat when I stopped competing. And it's still a huge part of my life, but it's yeah. not something I want to talk too much on anymore. Like I love talking about it and how it relates to happiness, life, mindset, super important. Health is super important, but I've just changed my stance and perspective slightly. And now I love being at the top of the umbrella, teaching other entrepreneurs how to build their online businesses through fitness or whatever their creative outlet is yeah. so they can you know, have a dream life that, that I've created too and they can in impact more people and enhance the lives of others. I love that. Yeah. I love that. So much to unpack over here. I know. I went down a lot of different paths. <laughs> no, no. But I think one of the really great things too is, is you've transitioned. You really like see life through the lens of creativity now, which is mm. an interesting aspect to the brand that I'm talking, you know, the brand that I'm building like neon is about living life of creativity. And yeah. that doesn't always mean you have to be an actual artist. Right. Per se, but it's about creating your life. It's about creating everything in it. And your art could be entrepreneurship. It could be, I mean, building bu any business. It could be actual art. It could be, you know, whatever you're passionate about. It's like the act of actually creating that. So, what would you say with you? Where that? Where did that that switch flip for you when you saw that? You saw that for yourself. Yeah, I think it was when I actually started doing it. So in some in the senior year, actually even before that, sorry. So I remember specifically my junior year of college. I was in nursing school. I had this friend that was like the spontaneous friend and I was the <laughs> reserved, let's say on the weekends and I'll go find the fun with you, but I'm not going to be like the creator of the fun cuz I was just, you know, a grandma. So she inspired me and asked me, "Hey, would you want to move to LA with me for the summer?" And I flat out said, "No." I was like, "Nope." don't want to that's terrifying i don't have any money or a job yeah. and she eventually just convinced me like let's just go apply for waitressing jobs we both have some waitressing experience and we emailed a bunch of random restaurants we found this like super casual restaurant on venice beach called the venice ale house <laughs> and we just applied as waitresses and the owner was like yeah come down we'll get you a job it'll be fine and we were like oh, okay then that was to me like the the final decision maker of like, okay, let's do this. So I remember paying for the first month's rent in like a little apartment in Venice and I had 30 bucks in my bank account. So I hustled to get a couple hundred extra dollars and move across the country and we drove. Um, I waitressed six, seven days a week. But to me, my, my day was essentially wake up, go to the gym, Gold's Venice, which was like the mecca of fitness, <laughs> still is. And I would, you know, go to bike to the beach and relax on the beach. And it was just like me, I was alone. It was so nice. It was beautiful every single day. Like the palm trees and the fantasy land was just like so mind blowing to me because I'm from Rhode Island, small yeah. state. Everything's kind of grim and bland and boring. And, and then I would go to work every single day. So that was a huge pivotal moment in my life because I think it helped me realize what was possible and I think the reason why I love LA is everybody's doing something and working towards something whether it's a passion a dream an entrepreneurial venture or they're just like trying to find themselves and like create a life for themselves yeah. basically it's full of creativity and in Rhode Island everything's pretty typical, pretty normal. There's no graffiti on the walls unless it's like ugly. There's no like beautiful buildings, like the building we're in today. The yeah. wall is like a huge mural painting. It's beautiful. And you don't see that anywhere else really, right. except for like New York. So um, Miami maybe, but <laughs> it was a really pivotal moment for me. And then in terms of when I realized that I could do it, aside from that was when I got reached out to by somebody that asked me, hey, can you be my fitness coach? I would love for you to coach me. And I was like, I don't really know how to do it with someone else. I've done it for myself. But I started building a little side business and I didn't even like think of it as a business. I was like, I'm just doing this thing. Yeah. And I eventually, my first year out of college, I made like 50 grand just doing that. And like, I know I was wow. like, that's a good bit. Like I could do this if I do it full time. Cause I had started in, you know, I did a little bit 
during my last bit of senior year, but I was in nursing school. So I was like very busy. I was waitressing a little bit. I was, you know, doing a couple clients on the side, but yeah. not that much, just like enough to get by. And when I graduated and I was waiting to take my nursing exam, which took four months for California to get me back the papers to say like, okay, you can go take it now, yeah. which I was twiddling my thumbs, making YouTube videos, having fun, doing this other, this other thing. Yeah. Um, I was, you know, making a business for myself. And because of that, it allowed me to see the only thing that was really holding me back was time and full on commitment. Yeah. So I read this book called The One Thing by um, Gary Keller. And Ooh. that book just changed everything for me. I was like, I need to do one thing, not two. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm gonna not do the nursing thing anymore, even though it was, I had already gotten a four year degree and that was my normal path and I wasn't spontaneous or outgoing or risk taking at all. Yeah. And that was like the biggest risk I've ever taken. But I knew that again, that gut feeling that, you know, if I continued, I could make a very good living and be safe, but it's also so fun. It was also yeah. allowing me to, you know, make YouTube videos. That was the first kind of place that I was able to be creative, like yeah. editing, putting things together, adding music to it, adding titles, making cool cinematic shots. And I was watching other people's videos and I was like, this is fun. Like I can be creative for once. Like this is super <laughs> fun and I can yeah. make workout programs and everything was just really enjoyable rather than like, you know, checking the boxes of like the list of things you have to complete. So. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's interesting that you can, um, you can jump through that, that transition like that. And what would you say you're, when you were going through that transition, what, like the fear, how did you overcome that fear of jumping, making that jump into Well, it was a really creating. slow jump really, to be honest, because it wasn't, like I said, I, I was never risk taking and spontaneous. So it was almost like I didn't really make the jump until I knew it was safe to jump. Mm. So I, I didn't even move across the country to LA committed full time. Like I tried it for three months right. and then I had another year in Rhode Island to be like, okay, I'm definitely going to do it. So it was almost spontaneous, but it was a three month thing. And everyone was like, oh, you can just come back and just like it for a little while. And then <laughs> you can always come back. And it wasn't commitment. Yeah. And when it came to starting the business stuff and the YouTube stuff, I was still in school and I was still on the track to be a nurse. Wow. So I wasn't committed, but it was almost like it just happened so amazingly by accident yeah. and it was still safe enough. Like I knew that I was going to be able to continue to pay for my bills at that point. Cause I was like, I am making enough to pay my bills and more. And all I have to do is decide whether or not I'm going to keep doing that or the other thing. So to me, it, it was almost like safety. There was a safety net under me. Mm -hmm. Um, and it wasn't as spontaneous as, some other people's stories could have been, but to me that yeah. was the way that made me feel really good and confident. Like I was very confident at the end when I made that that decision and jumped. Yeah, I, I totally know that. I was I had my uh, my safety unit was graphic design when I jumped right. into photography. So right. you could you could do both simultaneously yeah. and still make it. Yeah. Like totally. What what advice would you give to people that are that to create that sandbox of safety to as they jump off that cliff? Yeah. I think a lot of people jump off the cliff really quickly because they see other people doing it. Like they'll make $3,000 in a month and they're like, I'm good to quit my job. But I'm like, wait a second, like make it for a couple of months. To me, um, three or four to six months with a long-term plan almost, plus yeah. maybe making two thirds of your bills is enough of a safety net. So maybe having a couple of different things that you're doing, number one, like for me, um, I had sponsorships and fitness coaching and they were both kind of happening simultaneously. Mm. And then, you know, the nursing was, almost there and then I was like okay I don't need it so let's just not do it um, allowing yourself to get skilled at two different things I think is really really helpful and to have multiple streams of income passive income is really huge so things that are kind of just selling as you're working on your bigger dream is important so maybe you have to yeah. do things that you don't necessarily love in order to get to what you love and give it some time like hustle on it grind a little bit I'm, I'm a super um, advocate for taking space for yourself and self care, mm. but to an extent when you're trying to get to your dream while you're, you know, having your safety net, maybe your nine to five is your safety net. Maybe your thing that you don't love, but you l like kinda is your safety net. Keep up with that until you feel really confident that it's going to continue enough for you to feel safe. And safety is really just being able to pay your bills and not feel right. like you're just focused on the next paycheck. And that's, that's yeah. safety really. And then freedom is having extra. So there's a fine line, obviously, depending on where you live and what you do and 
who you have to pay for and what bills you have. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like bills at a, as a blanket statement is just make sure those are paid. And then, you yeah. know, eventually you'll get to the point where you can transfer your time and energy over to your main passion while slowly minimizing the, the thing that's keeping your bills paid. Yeah, absolutely. What kind of sacrifices would you say that you've made through that transition process? Because I know for me, like I had to sacrifice going out all the time where, you know, I lived in a basement of a of a uh, three bedroom house. It cost me 300 bucks a month. You know yeah. what I mean? What kind of things were, did you have to kind of sacrifice? To uh, really safety. Pursue this? I think safety was the biggest sacrifice. I think um, comfort zone is a sacrifice. I think people take their comfort zone and they're like, oh, this is the best thing. Like I could be staying here forever and be fine. And to me, my experience was that everything was fine. It was bland, it wasn't spectacular, but it was fine. And I think that's even a scarier place to be in mm. than the state of urgency where you're like, I literally have nothing, I have to hustle for this. Yeah. Because I had to get pulled out of fine and be thrown into amazingness to, to taste it just a, just a little bit. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the sacrifices I had to make, once I realized that fine wasn't enough for me anymore, because I had that one summer in Los Angeles, I sacrificed, you know, safety and comfort zone i moved completely across the country pretty much alone i had yeah. one i had a roommate um and we worked together that one summer that i lived there but i really had no friends like yeah. literally no friends because she was a manager of the restaurant at the time and she worked from like you know 9 a.m to 3 a.m all day so i was alone all day i remember i had one piece of furniture uh, you know i was doing my competitions i had no friends i was kind of kind of quiet, like I wasn't really gonna go say like, hi, nice to meet you, I'm, I'm yeah. new here, I'm Amanda. So I had to kind of not really have friends for a good bit, um, but I did meet people online, like I said. Yeah. And LA is a great hub for meeting people who are similar to you and who mm -hmm. are passionate. So I did meet a couple of friends, you know, and then eventually through the fitness industry, I grew a little bit more and then people came to LA and people moved. So I created a network out here finally. Um, but I think, yeah, friendship, loneliness was huge, but I think those sacrifices were actually blessings because it created the space for me to, to hustle. Yeah. Um, all I did was work because I didn't do anything else. <laughs> Literally nothing else. Like I would create YouTube videos. Yeah. I would go to the gym. Um, I was always on my fitness. Like I was doing my competition. So that's all I did all day. Yeah. And I was just, I had all day to basically hustle and like figure it out. Yeah. So to me, those sacrifices ended up being blessings. Yeah. That's great. And so what, I guess, compelled you to use that time, that down, I guess, downtime, if you will, mm. to be creating versus consuming? Oh, that's good. So I think I was at that point so passionate about making it work because I loved it. Like I was in the middle of this fitness industry thing where I was kind of like up and coming and there were people that were already doing really well with what I kind of wanted to do and realize like, okay, I could do that too. So that was very motivating to see somebody else in front of me almost yeah. kind of doing the same thing. So I was, I was consuming other people's content in the way that I was just trying to learn from how they did it and what they were doing. So I was like, okay, this is working for this person. Let me create this kind of video. Or I was, I was basically like, you know when actors watch movies for education? It was, right, yeah. was kind of like I was watching YouTube videos to learn how other people edited and made it look cool and what other people were doing. And that's how you kind of create anything really. Like you have all this inspiration from all these different sources. Yeah. So that was for me really motivating to see number one, other people doing it. And number two, I was just so freaking passionate. Like I, I just led with the passion. And I think... Yeah passion can get you to a certain place and then you have to kind of create systems to make it continue working because yeah. you know your passion can minimize and then you can get distracted and stressed out and all that stuff <laughs> yeah. but in the beginning passion was definitely like the biggest lead yeah mm. so how is your how have you seen your business grow since you started and how you've evolved yeah so in the big in the beginning it was only fitness coaching. So I would get a client inquiry from my social media. I never struggled to get clients and now I'm teaching people and I teach entrepreneurs now how to get clients and I'm teaching them even though they're struggling because I you know, started with an audience rather than wanting to build an audience in order to get clients. I just had the audience because I was building it for fun right. and then everyone just kind of reached out. So for me, that was easy in the beginning, easy in a, in a way where it just came to me by yeah. accident almost. So that was the main part of my business. I remember the summer that I moved officially, 
So it was May of 2015. I graduated and I knew I had to move and I was competing. So I made this ebook for like 30 bucks and I was like super excited because I made like a couple thousand bucks. Ooh. And I was like, oh my God, this, my mom was like, you're making like a thousand dollars on this thing that you just typed up. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> it was super Love funny. That. I remember being like my last month of college, I was finishing my homework and my studying. And then I would be like up late typing up this little ebook about how to track your macros. And I still have it, but that was like, you know, yeah. one of the coolest things I had passive income. I was like, that was my first experience with passive income. Yeah. I was like, wow. Again, no clue what entrepreneurship was. And um, moving forward, I grew my audience and I got my first sponsorship reach out. So the company reached out to me and said, we'll send you free supplements if you you know, post about this and we'll give you a discount code. Yeah. So there was commission and I was like, I'm making a couple hundred extra bucks and I'm working, like this is awesome. And I eventually got a salary from a different company to you know, a salary and commission. Wow. I made a, a six figure income in 2016 just from sponsorship stuff. Oh my God. Which was cool. It's just influencer marketing is new. It's interesting. I didn't know anything about it, but yeah. you know, just working through it as you went, negotiating deals, and then seeing the return on investment the companies got from me being associated or any influencer being associated with their stuff. It was just really cool. Um, and at the end of 2016, moving into 2017, I think I kind of realized, all right, I'm in this industry. A lot of people are doing the same exact thing. Is this long term? Like I would get questions because I shared everything about my life, right? So, um, are you going to continue doing this? Like, what's your five year plan? What if YouTube goes down? Or are you still going to be making YouTube videos when you have a family? And there was all these questions that I didn't know how to answer. Yeah. Never knew what a five year plan was for me. I was like, I've just been kind of going with the punches and rolling with whatever's happening. Yeah. So. I, I was questioning whether or not that was a long-term plan for me. And at the moment, like it was three years of me being super heavily involved in fitness. And then I was taking a little bit of a step back. I was like, all right, I don't want to compete anymore. Um, it's been a little bit too much extreme over here. And I want to like think less about it, but still do it. But like not be as hyper-focused on it. I don't want it to be the main puzzle piece of my life. I want it to be a, a smaller puzzle yeah. piece so I can focus on spirituality and my boyfriend and yeah. family and adventure and travel and fun stuff and business. So I joined Lewis's mastermind in January of 2017. And then I met all of these people who did online business and I was like, whoa, <laughs> there is so many other things to do aside from just being a YouTuber and having sponsorships. I had, yeah. again, no clue. Um, I didn't know what an email list was. So this sparked another creative moment. So I was like, oh, I, I can think of an idea and like create this whole, you know, this whole thing. So I created um, two new products last year that have been wow. huge for my business and I'm helping entrepreneurs now. So one of them is a certification program. I remember emailing Lewis. I was like, I have this idea. He's like, okay, think of this, 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 and this. And we built this whole certification program, my, my business partner and I who was my fitness coach. So we're helping on, um, teach people how to coach their clients and get their clients results. And they get a little sort of certificate and it's awesome. Amazing. And then I also created a higher price program. That's a 90 day mentorship program that takes people and walks them through the whole personal development and confidence they have to have in order to be an influencer online and then how to build their online businesses and be a yeah. fitness coach and all this stuff. So it's evolved so much just by by putting myself in the situation, same thing with when I moved to LA for the first time, putting myself in an environment of other creative people and then mm. opportunity to see what's possible. And the yeah. second that I see what's possible, I'm like, I am going to run with this so fast and so hard that yeah. no one will even know what happened. So it's been, you know, every year my, my income, and it's not just about the income, but my income and impact has at least tripled every single year for since I graduated college. And that's just been, it's just been a, a result of my ambition. It's been a result of my creativity. It's been a result of putting myself in the right environment. Yeah. Um, and then taking action on anything, even though it's scary. Like I always say, do that messy action and just kind of do it without feeling like it has to be perfect because it, as long as you do something, it can get better and you can enhance it. Same thing with like your podcast, like you're making great videos now and you probably didn't start with video for everything, but yeah. that's ideal obviously. And you'll eventually get like a studio and have everybody fly to you or whatever. And like, that's <laughs> my goal too. Like the Lewis Howes dream, but, um, <laughs> shout that out to Lewis. Lewis. Yeah. That Lewis Howes guy. <laughs> yeah. But, um, that's how we met too. So I just yeah. said Lewis's name, but, 
obviously you have a dream of dreams, but don't let that stop you from just starting. Yeah, absolutely. So you talked a little bit about prioritizing. You mentioned it, so let's like, unpack that a little bit. Yeah. You know, how do you how have you prioritized like a creativity? But you're talking about spirituality, your boyfriend. Mm -hmm. and your business and the fitness like yeah. you know because it, you got to create these buckets right so how do yeah. you how do you do that like how oh, have you, what like super what have hard. you found so i think the the first thing is just realizing that there, those are all slices of your life pie um just pointing them out so like you have your family your relationships with your friends you have your business you have your fitness so i think to me just thinking about those things every week on a weekly basis like how do i rank myself here did I focus, did I call my family this week? They live across the country. Like, did I chat with them enough? And a lot of the times it's no, and I need to get better at that. So I'm always kind of thinking of that. Mm. When it comes to fitness, to me, fitness is now, it helps me stay creative and it stays, it helps me stay in my creative flow. Mm -hmm. So if I don't have that, I miss out on the creativity and the amazingness of creation. Um, so I have to make sure that I prioritize having both of them. So yeah. just a little side note on that. To me, fitness now helps me stay energized. So mm. over the last year, I maybe fell off a little bit and just focused on my business and skipped workouts. And then I noticed myself getting really burnt out and I noticed myself feeling agitated and irritable and all of these feelings. And I was like, I can't be my highest self when I don't exercise, I can't. And my <laughs> highest self means I have to be doing interviews like this and talking to people like you and then being on video and talking to my people on YouTube and then writing amazing emails and then, you know, doing all this creation. Yeah. And if I'm not in the right mind state, it can't. It's, yeah. It just doesn't work. I get blocked. I am resistant. Um, and that comes from making sure that I give myself energy through exercise and through cardio and through having a really good workout um, five, six days a week. Like that yeah. makes me feel really energized and happy. Yeah. So if I don't have that, then I can't do my best work. Yeah. Um, so prioritizing that means it's also helping my business in a way. So if you can like kind of, <laughs> you can kind of see like, you know, humans are all, we're all self-centered in a way. Uh -huh. So you have to kind of decide like, how is this helping you in what you're prioritizing at the moment? Like, mm. is your fitness helping you with your family? Is your fitness helping you with your business? Is your business helping you with your family? Is your family helping you with your business? Like what is prior, what is a priority to you right now and how does it help other pieces of your life? Yeah. Like does your spirituality help you with your business? Does your business help you with your, you know, yeah. you have to kind of think how they relate based on what you're most prioritizing at the moment in your head. Yeah, absolutely. I know I've, I've been, doing a lot more working out myself and I definitely realized there you like, go. It, being in your body and moving it really helps fuel like just yeah. a yourself just like feeling good yourself but then also the, the creativity piece of it yeah, yeah like totally. it, it keeps you moving mm -hmm. and especially because entrepreneurship is so up and down mm. what kind of grounded. yeah what kind of downsides have you experienced that yeah, a good bit. So um, over the last year, like I said, with like the transition from just being in fitness, which had its own struggles, just transitioning to entrepreneurship created its own. So I'll talk about the fitnessy ones first, just the YouTube side. Yeah. Um, putting your your heart on your sleeve and putting yourself out there is terrifying. So I have been 113 pounds in the public eye in my YouTube videos, and then 140 pounds. So wow. there's been like massive differences in the way my body looks and the way that you know, I'm explaining things and I have to, because I've committed to sharing my thoughts and experiences with people, because that's how I most connect and that's how I make my impact. Yeah. So I had to explain how that felt to me and then, you know, how people's comments affected me and my body image and stuff like that. And that was, it's just, it's just difficult putting yourself out there and putting yourself in the face of judgment and criticism. There's been a ton of that. And I, again, I like to look at these things as blessings because I just did a podcast on this. It, it really, it helped me be confident in my mission and my message because I had to face all my insecurities head on. Mm. And I had to say, okay, I'm insecure about this. Someone's telling me, you know, basically yeah. like, hey, you're fat. You're too fat to be a YouTuber, a fitness YouTuber, or you're too skinny, or you're not qualified enough, or yeah. you're dumb, or I don't like the way that you said that thing, or I don't like the way that your socks don't match. And... I don't like the way that there's clothes on the ground in the back of your video, <laughs> like yeah. little little things that you wouldn't notice about yourself unless someone had the opportunity to point them out. It's like creating a reality TV show of yourself and people are like nitpicking everything, like I don't like the way that you're wearing that 
hat, Nick. It looks dirty. Yeah. People <laughs> Whatever. Are ruthless. Yeah, it doesn't matter what they say. And again, I like to think of it as like if you were watching the Kardashians and then there was an opportunity to have a comment section below, that's what YouTube is. Like they just whatever people are entitled to their opinions and they right. totally are um but again facing your insecurities head on so it's been super terrifying but I've, it's allowed me to be really confident in myself because i've had to work through that internally and say okay do i believe this what this person's saying is it true do i really think that uh, is that really who i am and i've had to say and stand strong and say no my highest self is this person i need to keep acting and being my highest mm. self in order to make the impact that I want to make. And then if I let that affect me, I become this fearful and insecure and uh, like lack mindset type of person that isn't who I was made to be. It's not yeah. the mission that I'm set out to be on basically. Yeah. Um, and then over the last year, something similar happened, just going from fitness to entrepreneurship, there was a lot of like confusion, just when you're not talking directly to entrepreneurs who understand the hustle and grind in order to make an income, in order to make an impact. Most people are working, you know, a regular job and they're not really thinking about their bank account too often because the money probably just goes in every two weeks and they don't, you know, you don't think about it a lot. Oh, it's, not, 100%. it's not something that's on the forefront of your mind. You're just, you know, living your life, you're going to work, you're hanging out with your family and it's great. But if you're not talking to that person and then you start talking about money and teaching people how to make it and all that stuff, it can come off. Um, people can take it the wrong way. Yeah. So a lot of the time it came off and maybe I presented myself in the wrong way or whatever, but um, it came off as if I was just trying to scam people out of their money and people made hate Instagrams wow. about me, about call, calling me Scamanda Bucci and all this fun stuff, which is no super fun. <laughs> yes, it was great. Wow. <laughs> so I had to, I had to do work around that and say, okay, am I really this like manipulative? Like, you know, marketing can be manipulative and the way that you say things about selling your products can be manipulative and people can take it the wrong way. And if you're not careful, it can come off like that. So I had to do a lot of research around that and a lot of internal work around that and make sure that I know like I am not that, that's not my intention. And I have to make sure that I make sure that I'm clear about that basically. Yeah. So getting clear on all of that stuff and finding confidence in the face of criticism has been definitely my my story. Yeah, mm. that's huge. Yeah. So how have you dealt with re rejection? I mean, I, I've been thinking, I was just thinking about this today, actually, like I've been, I've been rejected so much over the last few years, just in the world of creative, like work mm. and business. And it's, it's really hard to let it, not let it affect yeah. you and the narrative that goes around that. How have you dealt with that kind of thing. Yeah, it's been, like I said, it's it's something that you have to deal with because I, I love teaching people who are in a position that I used to be. And that's why I'm so passionate about teaching entrepreneurs. And before I was teaching fitness people, like that's just how I like to live life. Because if I'm not teaching somebody something, I think I'm just a teacher at heart. I don't feel like I'm a, on mm. in alignment. Yeah. Um, so if I were to think, okay, how am I going to tell my audience this? And I think it's been a blessing having a platform on social media. Yeah. How would I teach my audience how to deal with this? You know, what would you say? Like if you had a best friend that was dealing with that, what would you say? And you have to create that advice piece and that narrative if in order to teach it to somebody. Mm -hmm. So you have to experience it first. So. De dealing with rejection and criticism to me definitely I took it personally a lot of the time I felt sad because I almost believed the things people were saying a lot of the time and I had to question myself and make sure that those things weren't true yeah. and if you're not if you're not super confident you will believe those things and if you're not very validated I guess you will believe those things so I think validation externally for a lot of people helps them believe those things about themselves. So when someone comments on your picture and says, oh my God, I love your work, or when they comment and say, oh my God, your stuff sucks, you, you have to kind of question like, does it suck or do, they, do you love it? Yeah. So the middle ground is, do you believe those things? Do you believe that your work is good? Do you believe that your intention is pure? And you have to really ask yourself that. Yeah. So I think it's a lot of self-reflection and self-awareness. Yeah, 
That's huge. Mm. It's a lot. It's a lot of uh, a lot of self reflection. It's not really in, as easy as like just self reflect. Obviously, yeah, no, it takes a good bit of work. It, I, I do a lot of complaining to my close loved ones for a second until <laughs> until I can finally work through it and say, here's how I did it. But it's, it's yeah, definitely not as easy as exactly. that. Exactly. So you mentioned spirituality. What kind of spirituality have you been researching, practicing? What is what's important to you? Yeah, that's a good question. So. Spirituality to me is something that I've almost struggled with the most in terms of rating my, if I was to take that pie of things, yeah. I would rate myself as like a two right now. Only because I grew up Catholic and I went to Catholic high school and um, when I moved, and sorry, when I went to college and when I moved, I disconnected from that just because, you know, it wasn't something I was super connected to as a kid. So I, I am working towards, and I think it takes energy and you have to actually spend time working towards it. Um, just trying to find that thing that I feel really connected to, yeah. that higher power that I feel connected to. Like I always, whenever I talk about a higher power, I always talk about like the universe rather than God. It's, it's just one of those things that I'm trying to really nail down and I don't want to commit to anything until I spend the time learning about it. Yeah. So to me, I haven't prioritized learning about it just yet. Like I'm 24, not that that's an excuse, but it's just, I have to create that time to yeah. really dig deep into my soul for that. And I think I will. Um, it's just not currently a priority, but it's in the back of my head. Yeah. And right now it's really just learning about myself and spending time with myself. Um, making sure that I'm doing the right thing, that my intentions are pure, that I'm always thinking about others and serving others and helping others and my family. And um, whenever I'm making decisions, thinking about those things and thinking about, you know, is this the pathway that I'm meant to take? Yeah. Um, I like to think about everything happens for a reason. So regardless of what situations happen to you, there's a reason for them. And I truly firmly believe that. So I think yeah. all of these things that I innately feel mean something, but defining what that means is something that I'm working towards. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing. Yeah, of course. It's definitely like, a, it's definitely a journey for sure. And yeah. it takes time. It takes just like living every day and like yeah. understanding where, you know, I'm still finding my own. I think people easily, you know, don't call it a journey because they kind of just fall into what their parents did. And it's easy to do that. You know, yeah. it's super simple. I could have done that and be like, I'm a Catholic because I grew up that way. And, yeah. but you can choose to not or you can choose to, but I think choosing to not is harder and scarier because you yeah. have to put yourself out there again. But if it's important to you, then you'll, you know, you'll prioritize it. Yeah. And I mean, putting out, especially if, if it's not what you grew up with. Right. I mean, I grew up in the church as well. And yeah. It's like a totally different, I believe totally differently now. Mm -hmm. And it's even that's hard to yeah. put out there yeah. and to, you know, to really grapple with in life. Mm -hmm. Totally. So. Very interesting. Very yeah, interesting. Thanks for asking. Yeah, and your um, your other buckets. What are what are in your other priority buckets? Your family uh, relationships. Yeah. So I think I had this conversation with another girl in Lewis's mastermind named Jenna, and we talked about what is your motivator. So some people are motivated by money. Some people are motivated by challenge. Mm. We determine. We think Lewis is motivated by challenge. Um, some people are motivated by time. So creating more time for yourself to do the things that you want to do. Mm -hmm. For me, it's definitely time. I, I am very motivated by having more time with my family. Like they live across the country and they're very important to me. And I, I hate feeling like I'm too busy to talk to them for any reason. So yeah. ideally I would have like a four hour work week and I would <laughs> maybe not a four hour work week, maybe like a, a 10 to 15 hour work week would be nice. Cause I love challenge too. And I love working and impacting. Yeah. And I feel like if my, I mean, obviously my work doesn't always feel like work to an extent, but a lot of it does still. So to me, time motivates me. So time with my family, like I said, um, time with my boyfriend. So I prioritize my relationship a lot. I see a future with him. So I prioritize like, yeah. you know, spending time working on it and doing fun, adventurous things. Another thing, I, I want to spend time traveling. I love traveling. Um, I think, you know, I would love to be as well traveled as you. Like, that'd be a dream <laughs> of dreams, being able to see all parts of the world and culture and just going on that Pencils of Promise trip I just came back from. It was really world shifting for me. Mm. Um, I've never really felt super connected to philanthropy. I was always kind of just like, I know I want to give back, but, you know, giving my money and, and, maybe sending my clothes to a woman's shelter doesn't really feel like anything. Yeah. It kind of does. But when you go there and see that, you're like, all right, I am a part of this family now. Like I feel very connected. Yeah, so absolutely. I'm really excited about that. 
Amazing. Yeah. So what would you say shifted when you were down there? Like, or what did you, what opened up? Because I know yeah. I've been there many times and yeah. I know it's just like, it's always, I, every time I go, it's like an eye-opening eye trip mm -hmm. in a, some way or another. Yeah. So a couple of things. I think the first thing that's not to do with the philanthropy is just seeing a third world country, an underprivileged country, um, beautiful country, Guatemala. It's like gorgeous. And I've never been, you know, the countries I've been to, I went to... London and Germany for a fitness expo. I've been to like Hawaii. I've been to like the Bahamas. Um, haven't really been anywhere where I was doing like a mission trip or that kind of work. Mm -hmm. So going into the actual communities, I was like, whoa, this is what the world is like in some places. And you, yeah. you see it on TV and you like kind of get it, but you don't really get it until you go into a village where people are sleeping in the dirt and you know, they're making three bucks a day and they don't really have anything. And you see pregnant women everywhere. And there's a hundred kids and they're just coming up to you like hugging you so grateful that you've given them this opportunity to learn and I think I think creating a business to me now means something different mm -hmm. like it means I get to give somebody else like their opportunity to grow as a person and have the opportunity to learn and get an education like depends on me and yeah. depends on you yeah. and it you're literally impacting their life in a massive way because you get to donate that amount of money um, and your time obviously to go see them and everything but like those trips are they're not necessarily for us to like build the school but they're for us to see the impact that yeah. we've been able to make and then inspire other people to make the same kind of impact and because we have platforms we can show like hey this is how cool this thing is yeah so th yeah that you know just the culture in general and seeing different cultures and I was so excited to be able to um, re-learn Spanish a little bit. And I was like, oh yeah, I remember some words and that was really fun. Um, and then just the philanthropic aspect of it. So again, I was connected to giving, but I didn't know how. And I was like, I think a lot of people pick philanthropies based on what happened in their life. So, mm. you know, sexual abuse or, you know, any eating disorders or anything that's actually happened to them. Mm -hmm. And I had a good childhood. Like, I didn't really have anything super crazy happen to me. So I was like, what do I do? What do I pick? And it was mm. almost like a what do I do kind of thing. So I found Pencils of Promise through, through Lewis, obviously. And then I realized down there how connected I was to the message of education. Mm. Yeah. It really helped me realize like this is this is my path and this yeah. is the way that I want to go. Amazing. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So let's dive, dive over into I want to know a little bit more about your creative process when you're creating your art, YouTube videos, social media yeah. posts, things like that. What how do you approach that? So when it comes to social media posts, a lot of people um, will schedule them out and stuff like that. I literally make every single long form post right then and there. Like I don't wow. Like maybe I'll have an idea in my head, but I'm usually sitting down. If I'm rushed or busy or thinking about other things, I can't really get in that state. So I'll talk about that in a sec. But yeah, every single time it's right then and there. And I'm always, wow. and I've always done that. Like all my posts are long, pretty much like 99% of them. There's some people that are like, the day that you write a short post and then I'll write like one short post and they're like, yeah, you wrote a short one. But most <laughs> of my people love reading all of them. They're like, it's like my blog basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then when it comes to the photos and stuff, it's kind of, it used to be kind of just whatever I could do. Mm -hmm. And now I love working with photographers like you. And we did a photo shoot about, you know, my brand and how I wanted to kind of represent myself. And I've come slowly to figure out who I am as a brand. Mm -hmm. And it's been super difficult. Yeah. It's, it's not something you just kind of decide unless you're really good at marketing and branding. Yeah. But if you're a personal brand, you're like, okay, who am I? What's my brand? And for me, it's really just about empowering other people, um, showing people that they can build their dream life. If you know they work at it, they realize that they have to change their mindset, they take messy action, all of that stuff. So to yeah. me, just representing that in an image is really fun and enjoyable to always kind of figure that out. So yeah. I'm always just you know, in a beautiful location or smiling. We did a lot of twirls and flips and shit like that, <laughs> which is fun, but it comes out, you know, it comes out happy and it comes out yeah. an exciting thing to look at and experience. And then when it comes to my creative process, it's so important for me to not wear too many different hats in one day, because when you're building a business, it's almost like the time that you spend getting to be creative minimizes so you can run the business. So right, that, right, that right. happened a ton for me last year. Like I stopped making as many YouTube videos. I went from three a week to like maybe one a week. Cause I was like, I just don't have the mind state to pick up the camera and vlog right now. Like I'm busy. And yeah. it was just different. Cause before that was the only thing I was doing. So 
It's really, 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 really helped. The number one thing was to separate out the pillars of what I do and just do one thing a day. Ooh. So Thursdays are podcast days. So I've been podcasting since like 8 a.m. this morning. Oh my God. Yeah. And then I have another one after you. So it's just oh, like wow. a full day. But that's the only day a week that I have to do it. And yeah. maybe even twice a month rather than, you know, doing one on a Tuesday and one on a Friday. And it just, you don't, you don't have that transfer of energy yeah. and you don't have to shift the energy you have to step into. Like this energy is far different than a Wednesday energy, which is me writing emails or <sighs> re my, me writing marketing stuff or Facebook ads or anything like that. Yeah. And then Tuesdays is video creation. So that means I put on makeup, I look nice. <laughs> wow. You know, I, I do that. Normally I'm just sitting in my pajamas. So if I have to make a YouTube video on a day where I'm doing like pajama meetings <laughs> in my apartment, <laughs> I'm like, God, I don't want to. So yeah. separating out what hat I wear on specific days has been literally the biggest game changer ever for me. Wow. Yeah. I have to try that. Yeah. I am all over the place it's, all the it, time. Do you feel like it's hard to step into like photographer versus oh my God. business mode? It's like impossible. Yeah. Yeah. It's every day. It's like different. I'm running around. I'm doing one, one thing or another. Try and... it. Trust me. It'll make a huge difference. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to give that a whirl. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever, what other creative outlets do you, do you have that you love? Um, so... Good question. I could probably have more. I think, um, you know, right now I'm trying to just like be a better podcaster and a better creator. So I think I like to learn about how to write better. I like to learn about how to speak better. So I'm mm. doing a little bit of speaking and doing some speaking events. So that's yeah. new and challenging. And I think it's really just about challenge my, challenging myself to be better at all of the little tasks that I have to do within my business right now, which is really fun. Yeah. So I did really well at creating really awesome YouTube videos. So now it's like, how can we make better, better Facebook ad videos? Like, I don't know about that. Yeah. And then how can I be a better podcast interviewer? Like, let's listen to more Tim Ferriss and Joe Rogan and figure out how they interview and stuff like that. And then how do we, you know, write better copy for my emails? Like, I didn't really write for copy purposes before. I just wrote whatever. Yeah. So it's kind of just challenging myself in those little aspects right now. But there's actually um, my online business manager and I, she's very much about creating your life before your business. Mm -hmm. And we have this little like dream of dreams thing where I take like a month sabbatical and just like learn a task like dancing mm -hmm. or painting or whatever, just like fun stuff, maybe photography where I get yeah. really good at it. Um, so that's like the dream of dreams, but not there yet, <laughs> but not I'll get yet. there. It's, it's a work in progress. Like I said, time is important to me. So a whole month off to like do a tasks and go on a sabbatical and, you know, create a new skill is super fun. Yeah. That would, that would, I don't know if I could do that. Tim Ferriss does it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you just got to batch up everything and have it automated for the month. Yeah. Yeah. But. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah. So how, like, I guess, how do you do, how have you been delegating things, especially like if you're trying to focus on one thing, right? How do you get all these other things done in your business? You've got to a, hire the right team, but how do you, how have you gone about learning how to do that? Yeah. So last year I didn't have a team at all in the beginning of the year and I spent a ton of money on a team, <laughs> like a lot. Um, and just hiring people that are really good at what they do and that are super mission driven yeah. to me, my idea is that I am in a really great position where I started off businessy stuff with an awesome, engaged, loyal, um, targeted audience. And they're just excited to be a part of my life and be a part of my tribe and my products. Yeah. So it's been really a blessing to have that ready to go almost because I'm not fearful or in lack mode of, okay, if I spend on this, I'm not going to be able to make it back. Like I know that once we create the right products and create the right, you know, message and impact and solutions surrounding them, that yeah. they're going to work. There's no question about whether or not they're going to work. So I almost, I have like financial advisors and stuff to make sure that I'm not overspending or like being dumb or whatever, obviously. But, um, I've been able to invest in the right people so the right things can get done. So mm. creating really smart systems has been huge. 
That's what an online business manager does or an OBM. They create the systems that you need to make sure happen from start to finish of a project. So for a podcast, for example, you have the scheduling of the interview, you do the research for the person that you're interviewing, you get the equipment ready to go, you have your you know meeting place ready to go, and, and then after post-production comes, you have to make sure it's edited and it gets the right tags and it gets the right title and the right image and sending it to the person and then making sure it goes to your email, <laughs> all these things. It's a system. Yeah. It has to be really on, on point. It has to be really tight. It like yeah. it, and then you know if not something slips through the crack. So yeah. I think for me investing in your systems will allow you to be more creative yeah. because you know that it's going to get done and you're not stifled by like crap what's going to mess up today or like what's going to break next. <laughs> like you know that things are in place yeah. that they're not going to yeah. break. Yeah, I I definitely need to work. I'm working through that myself. Yeah, creating systems that. Because it just frees up your time, essentially. Yeah, and as a creative person, you're not, you know, you don't need to be the system creator. Somebody no. else is really good at that. Got to find that right person. Delegating is important. Yeah. <laughs> Delegation is huge. Yeah. That's something I wish I would. I would. I wish I would have hired an assistant like way more, way earlier into the game. Because mm -hmm. you know, but I was always like scared to spend the money. I yeah yeah totally. I was too, and then I realized what could happen when I did. I don't think I'm like a money hoarder and I don't think I'm dumb with it or anything, but I don't like keep it for myself. Like I I'm, I'm okay with investing, but I'm scared to invest my time. So if there's like mm. a big event, I'm like, oh, my energy is going to be sucked from the event because I'm kind of introverted. <laughs> so I get terrified to, to do stuff like that. Like um, Jen, Lewis's girlfriend called me last week and she's doing this personal development course, ALA or MITT, yeah. whatever. So she's like, hey, do you want to sign up now? I know you said that you wanted to do it. And I was like, oh, I'll do, do, I'll do it later. I'm just scared because I don't know if something's going to come up and I need personal time and I need to be alone because I, I love my alone time. And she like convinced me to sign up right then and there. But yeah. I get scared to give up my time rather than my money. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. We, we all have 24 hours in a day. Mm -hmm. You can always make more money. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Harder to make more time. <laughs> I agree, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How have you, what's been your mindset with like lack versus abundance or scarcity versus abundance, especially as an entrepreneur? Because we all know that it's like yeah. up and down and up and down. Totally. And like, how have you dealt with that? Yeah, I think, um, I think when you're not doing well or you're not doing as well as you would like to or you're thinking that you could be doing better based on somebody else, super easy to be in lack mindset. Like earlier in the year, I was definitely in lack mindset where, um, I was having to prove myself almost to my audience and say like, hey, I am a successful entrepreneur that can help others yeah. rather than just I can help myself. It's kind of like you're a good photographer, but can you teach someone else to be a good photographer? Like there's, if you're going to charge for that, like can you? Are you, yeah. can you do it for somebody else? So I had to prove myself a little bit and I was... I was almost in lack mindset because I was seeing all these other cool entrepreneurs teaching and I was like, who am I, you know, to create yeah. this thing and somebody else could probably do it better. So that creates this negative energy surrounding like, I have to get this person results or else, or I have to get them to sign up or else I'm screwed or else I'm dumb or else I'm not good enough or yeah. it just creates this like super tight weird energy yeah. and it's yucky and it's awful. It sucks. Uh, how do you shift out of it? Um, I think that, you know, shifting out of your own selfishness of how do I look into like, how do I help this person? Whatever you're doing, whatever, you know, maybe for you, a photographer, like, okay, I'm in lack mode. I feel like I can't get enough jobs. Like, how do I make this one job really freaking awesome? Yeah. Like, how do I make the most value and give the most value to these people and whatever service or product you're providing? Mm -hmm. And I think once you shift out of that, and stop focusing on what other people are doing and just focus on making the task at hand the best you could possibly do. It also, it almost feels like you are making that big impact that you're wanting to make because they're so happy with what you just provided that it'll allow them to share and be excited and yeah. you know give you a good testimonial if you ask and it's not this yucky energy, it's like this really positive energy. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's always so much about how what the energy that you bring to the table in any given interaction. Totally. Especially. Absolutely. Yeah. So what about top three books that you'd recommend right now? Oh, good question. So um, one of the books I read this year, it was it was I liked reading leadership books this year and how to be a better leader because I was building a team and I was like, what am I doing? No clue what's going on. <laughs> um, I read this book called um, Radical Candor, yeah. really good by Kim Scott, I believe. And it's all about how to challenge people directly while caring for them personally. Mm. 
-hmm. So how you can, you know, criticize people and what they're doing and how they're working with you and for you in this really loving way that motivates them and empowers them to be really good at what they're doing and not feel like resentful towards you and have this weird energy, again, energy. Um, Because some people, you know, will go and um, talk about someone behind their back or they'll just call them a mean name and be mean to them or they'll just ignore the situation completely and like avoid conflict. So all of those things are bad. But when you can say to someone, hey, I appreciate what you're doing. I think you're doing a great job. Let's chat a little bit about this product. Like, what can I do to be a better leader to you? How can I help you? Yeah. Rather than you suck, like you're underperforming. <laughs> so that was, book was really helpful. Yeah. yeah. Um, I loved I loved the Grant Cardone book. Um, 10x his 10x book was really good. Okay. Um, his energy is very like get shit done, motivational, like seller be sold like that kind of thing yeah. and i think at, at that point that i was reading that like i needed that masculine energy to be like yeah like i'm worth it <laughs> i needed that like conviction that he has so even if you're not super connected to the energy of the person maybe you can just take some of what they have and use it in your own way yeah which i love um and then another book that i read this year that was really great was mindset psychology by carol dweck i love psychology it was all about growth versus fixed mindset so it, t- it gave a, lot, a ton of examples of kids in schools who were told you're either in the dumb class, the slow class, or you're in the accelerated class. And kids believe that their talent and their abilities are fixed when they're being told what they are and they're put in a box. And then mm. when kids are being told or praised for their efforts rather than their talents or, or lack thereof, yeah. their, their growth is exponential. So I loved that book. It was awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I think the world needs more of that. Like. It's, it, the emotional intelligence side of things yeah. you know, from a young kid. That's yeah. Like, I guess we're all learning more and more as we get older and it's like, oh man, you know, we wish that our parents would have taught us certain things that now we see. But maybe that's a movement that's happening now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what's what's next? What's in the future? Mm, the um, so a couple of things. I'm doing a big live event in September, which I'm super wow. excited about. Yeah, I know. I'm that's like exciting. diving right into live events. Um, I've done some smaller ones with my students over the last year and I just, I think in-person meeting is so much more powerful than any Instagram post, any YouTube video, any podcast or any Zoom, you know, Skype call that you can have. Yeah. In-person is just so transformational. So I wanted to do that and I was super excited. That's exciting. And, um, I'm excited about the vacation that I have coming up to Tulum, which I'm going to go. I'm super excited. Recharge time. It'll be great. <laughs> um, and then I'm excited about the podcast this year. I, yeah. I, I feel like last year, my podcast was such a great way for me to connect with really amazing people and then give such high value to my audience. So yeah. I'm excited for the podcast to grow and to expand and to see um, how my impact grows and how, you know, what my tribe is going to do and create. Like there's so many people that are now inspired to create more yeah. because I have taken that stance myself. Yeah. Like I love just being a role model in that way that helps inspire someone else to, it ignites their fire. It's like my kind of little mantra that yeah. I always say, it ignites their fire to go do their own thing. And that's my mission and the impact I want to make. I love that. Yeah. Well, amazing. I acknowledge you for the impact that you're making in the world. It's, it's amazing. Where can people you. find you on the interwebs? Um, on Instagram at Amanda Bucci. And you can find me on my website, amandabucci.com or podcast Bucci Radio. Amazing. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's awesome. Yeah. Appreciate it. Bye, guys. Bye.